So I want to move now into a discussion of Schelling's Ages of the World, which is a text that he wrote and rewrote many times between about 1810 or so and 1815, and which I think can best be described as Schelling's anti-phenomenology of the spirit. Uh, it, is, it is a text that was his response to Schelling's phenomenology, which, or to Hegel's phenomenology, which he regarded as something that was too abstract, uh, something that was merely composed of dead, formal, empty, conceptual thinking without any sense of the living inward grasp of the spiritual dimension. Um, long about 1809, 1810, uh, two major events happened uh, to Schelling that sent him into a kind of a tailspin, into a crisis period during this period, in which he published very little for about the next two decades, very little. And the first event was the publication of Hegel's Phenomenology of the Spirit in 1807, which uh, catapulted Hegel to fame and put Schelling's career into abeyance. He, he began to become less, people were just more interested in Hegel and no longer in Schelling. And uh, I think he felt that this was unjust because I don't, he obviously did not like the phenomenology of the spirit. He criticizes it both in this book and in a platonic dialogue that he wrote at about this time called Clara. The platonic dialogue was his response to the second crisis as Ages of the World was his response to the crisis of dealing with Hegel, his attempt to sort of rival Hegel, was the death of his wife Caroline in 1809, who died, and his response to that was to write a text called Clara as a platonic dialogue around, which dates roughly probably from around, the, the date is in dispute, but probably from around 1809, 1810, somewhere in there, in which uh, you can see that he's very visibly upset and shaken about the death of his wife, and he spends the entire length of that text discoursing about the afterlife in the spirit world and what happens to the soul uh, after death and so on. So these are the two responses and the to the, the crisis period now. And Ages of the World was a text that Schelling wrote and rewrote and rewrote many, many times. It existed as it was found in many versions in a cache that was found up in an attic prior to World War II in which there were at least 12 different handwritten versions and a couple more that were set in TypeScript and were ready to go to the printer. And Schelling kept saying over the years that the text, his great masterpieces, Magnum Opus, Ages of the World, was about to appear, but it never did appear and it was never published in his lifetime. And that cache of texts, all the different versions of it were lost during the bombing raids of World War II. And so the texts were lost, and but fortunately three of them had survived. Three different versions survived and were published uh, between 1810 and 1815. And it's the version from 1815, the third version, that we'll be discussing in this set of audio files. The second version is the one that is published uh, in the Zizek book, The Abyss of Freedom, Ages of the World. That one is translated by Judith Norman. That's the second version. It's not that different. It's a little shorter than the third version. The third version is somewhat longer, and it exists in two different English translations. The one that is put out by SUNY was put out recently, and I find it to be an inferior translation, actually, to the one that was first translated into English in 1942, uh, the DeWolf translation, or the DeWolf version, the, he was the editor of it, uh, that was put out in 1942, I find to be a superior version, and that version is available online in the Internet Archive Library, so you can find it there online. I, I submit that you should pull that version up and look at it and read it rather than the Sunni version, which I think is clumsier. Uh, and it's also heavily dependent upon that version. The verbiage is similar, but where the verbiage in the uh, Sunni edition departs from the DeWolf edition, it does so to the detriment of the text and it makes it more obscure at precisely the points where the other text, the DeWolf text, makes, it, makes the text clearer, really. So we have these different versions of the ages of the world. And the initial, um, the initial title of the book was The Three Ages of the World. So it was meant to encompass, it was meant to be an opus that would, uh, in, that would describe the creation of God, God's creation of himself and his self-manifestation through history in both the past and the present, but also in the future. He didn't write the future. Um, he had already described to a certain extent the future destiny of the soul in Clara, and sometimes Clara is appended wrongly, I think, to Ages of the World to fill that gap. That's a mistake because Clara is a very different text with very different intentions. And he wrote a few pages, according to his son, who said that he saw a few pages of the, the section on the present, uh, but that's missing, and now all we have is the section on the past, which amounts to a text that's about 100 pages long, so it's, it's short, but it's very, very dense, and so will require a series of audio files to go through it.
bit by bit. And the text was just never apparently to Schelling's satisfaction. He hesitated to publish it, and it was never to his satisfaction. It was, after all, his agon with Hegel. It was his attempt to respond to the dry abstractness of Hegel with, uh, with a text that Schelling regarded as visionary and spiritual. So if we begin to turn to the text now, if we look at it, we can see that it's divided into three sections. We have the first book, The Past, which is subdivided into letter A, the eternal life of the Godhead as the whole, or the construction of the complete idea of God, B, the life of the individual potency, and C, the actual assumption of being or birth by God. So God gives birth to himself and he creates the physical world. Um, and so the physical world is to a certain extent the manifestation of God, exactly as it is for Hegel. But here, for Schelling, it is so in a different way. So if we move right into the introduction, Schelling begins by saying that what is past is known, what is present is discerned, and what is future is divined. The mode for the, for the past, for the known, is that of narration. The mode, for the, discern, the mode for the discerned or the present is that of the presented or the represented. And the mode for the future is that of prophecy. And he says then that the conception of science, hitherto accepted, is that it is a mere consequence and development of concepts and thoughts. But the true conception is that for science, and by science he really means your philosophical science, is that it should be a development of a living, actual essence, being, which is represented in it. Now, by being here, he means a being, namely the God idea. God is the absolute for Schelling, and it is the living reality of science that philosophical science studies and has now been brought back in here, rescued, as it were. Kant almost put it out of its misery, but of course, with Hegel and Schelling and Fichte, it has been brought, the God idea has been brought back in as the central focus for science now. And so... Um, this now, uh, the God idea, is the primary thing, the being idea, the attempt to understand being, uh, that is the primary thing for philosophical science to study. But now Schelling moves into a disquisition on the proper modes for accessing knowledge of the divine being. And he says that there must be a principle in man that is outside time and the world, but that is within him since the human soul was created at the beginning of creation, and it must therefore contain within it memories, traces, engrams, representations of the entire history of the unfolding of the cosmos, which must lie in a slumbering, buried state within it, in this dark, slumbering principle within man. Now this section, these first three pages of the introduction, are most indubitably a foreshadowing of the Jungian theory of the collective unconscious, which comes right out of this. And whether Jung read Schelling or not doesn't matter because this is part of the structure of the German philosophical mind. And at this point we find here what Schelling basically says about these two principles that are within man, a dark primal principle that contains empty representations within it in a state of slumber, that a higher supramundane principle has to awaken, has to dive down, descend, and bring those representations up into the light of consciousness, is precisely the method of Jungian psychoanalysis, which has to do with the movement of unconscious contents out of the collective unconscious that are brought into the conscious waking awareness. And so Jung comes right out of this. And so I find it a bit disingenuous whenever Zizek dismisses Jung as a mere New Age obscurantist, but yet he holds up Schelling as this great philosopher. I think there's, there's an agenda hidden in there because what Schelling is saying is the same thing, essentially, in essence, as what Jung says. Um, and so he starts off by saying that there must be within man this dark primal principle that contains memories of the cosmos that are accessible <clears throat> through a faculty that uh, Schelling borrows from Plato here and he calls anamnesis or rec recollection, which is the ability of the higher principle in man, the supramundane principle of conscious understanding and awareness to dive down into the slumbering depths of the psyche and to pull these representations up out into light so that the human being is composed actually of two beings, a questioner, the conscious mind, and an answerer, or the dark unconscious, which is like this dark, blind, sleeping, dreaming, instinctual, oracular wisdom that slumbers within us, exactly as it does for young, uh, which contains knowledge within it, which has knowing within it, knowledge within it, but is not the knower. The questioner, the supramundane principle, and this is basically the same thing as the distinction between soul and spirit, unconscious and conscious mind, is the principle that does the asking. And we can see here that this is the mythological motif that's known in mythology as the earth diver motif, whereby uh, 
a god or a being descends down into the watery abyss, as Vishnu does when he takes on the form of the boar after the goddess Earth has been kidnapped by an elephant demon and taken down into the depths of the ocean. And he has to descend down into the depths of the ocean in the form of the boar and uses his tusks to dig the earth up from the bottom of the sea and to bring it up into the light. It's the same exact myth, and that's only one example of a myth that is prevalent all throughout, from, from India all through the Pacific into the New World. It's known as the earth diver motif, and it's as though he were in... Uh, what he's saying here is equivalent to that myth, that, that the supramundane higher principle in man comes to conscious knowledge and awareness of the dark primal ur ground within us uh, by descending down and bringing it up through the process of recollection, which is the true philosophical procedure, the, the procedure of philosophical science. Now, um, what science does, science um, does with the historian and the philologist, there's an attempt on their part to reconstruct history using the external tools of objective science, namely texts and discourse and a piecemeal reconstruction of the tracks of the spirit, as it were, that have to be constructed objectively. But now where the, uh, the subjective method of reflection goes wrong is when it lacks an inward sense. In order for anything, Schelling says every, everything, absolutely everything, even what is by nature external has to be imbued with this sense of the inward visionary dimension in order for it to be useful. No historian's portrait of the past, if it's a mere record of facts uh, and dates and names, is useful unless that historian has a visionary capacity to go back into that epoch and to reanimate it in his imagination with the breath of the spirit, to give it a pulsing inward numinous life, exactly the way that the poet does, let's say, in, in constructing an epic or a novel. So too must the historian, and also by extension the philosopher, be able to do this. And for him, this is where he gets his first dig in in Hegel. The the dialectic method of Hegel is a merely is the merely formal, dead, dry, objective, empty method of doing this. And this is his first dig at, at Hegel, where Hegel for him just deals with the objective method of reflection in its use of pure, dry, discursive concepts that are shorn of any real sense of the poetry of the spirit, of the direct visionary realm of representation. And so what we have here in the introduction to Ages of the World is a dichotomy between vision on the one hand, uh, which is the inward oracular life uh, that is the mode of recollection, the mode of anamnesis, and it's the primary native mode for the poet and the artist, uh, but the poet and the artist lack the, the other mode that's opposed to it, the mode of reflection, the objective mode, the external mode, um, that a philosopher like Hegel takes too far. But now he says that you can also go too far in the opposite direction, the inward direction, the visionary direction, uh, and he has in mind here, he, what he says here is that the theosophist is the one who goes too far in the direction of the spirit and thinks in terms of pictorial images and images and, and visions but doesn't have any kind of reflective conscious awareness of what the implications of the images are. He sort of drowns in the image, and he has in mind here a mystic like Jakob Burma, but I think we can also say that he would say probably the same thing of Rudolf Steiner, who comes after him here. And in many res respects, Rudolf Steiner is the sequel and continuation of Schelling in another medium, whereby Rudolf Steiner's, what he calls in his book Cosmic Memory, the reading of the Akashic Record, uh, is precisely what Schelling is talking about here as the process of recollection, reading the Akashic record that is within us and that contains memory, engrams, and traces of the, the entire evolution of the cosmic history of the spirit. But the mystic goes too far for Schelling, and he's trying to fly, he's announcing here in the introduction, that he's trying to fly a middle path between the visionary excesses on the one hand of the mystic, the theosophist, and the dry, dead excesses of the Hegelian philosopher or the empty scientist on the other. So we have here a middle ground that he's attempting to fly between Hegel on the one hand and somebody like Rudolf Steiner on the other, um, and that the ages of the world will be a text that will fly this middle ground and it will have a sense of conceptual verbiage and discourse that will be simultaneously animated by an inward pulsing, numinous, luminous glow within it that, that will have a proper respect for and a poetry of the spirit. And I do indeed think that Hegel lacks the sense for the understanding of the poetry of the spirit that Schelling really grasps. And both Schelling and Schopenhauer were, were, were enemies of Hegel and both criticized him for similar reasons, namely that Hegel is just too abstract. You see Schelling in his novel Clara, for instance, he gets in a dig at Hegel there where he has his character Clara reading the phenomenology and saying, this is 
impossible to understand. And how, why is it that philosophers of today can't write the way they speak in, in a clear mode of discourse? And it, it's a little bit comforting and interesting, I suppose, that even Schelling found Hegel to be unintelligible, as he, as he says there in that.